Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Up India Karega Invest, um, an initiative by Grow to reach out to all of you every week with an interesting topic. Uh, today's topic is equity markets post pandemic. We are experiencing the second wave, and then I'm sure we're going to pass this through as well. And what is it you can expect from equity uh, markets uh, post the pandemic? So to discuss on the topic, we have a very interesting personality today. You have heard him before. Uh, Mr. Sunil Subramaniam is the managing director and CEO of uh, Sundaram Mutual Fund. Um, uh, I think one of the best uh, speakers you, you know you could come across in in these uh, events. Um, so he will be giving us his perspective with respect to what that you can expect from the equity markets post the pandemic. So today's session would be I would start the session just build build a broader base and then subsequently hand it over to Mr. Sunil. Um, then after Sunil sir Shikhar from Uh, grow would uh, take you through the grow product and then we'll open the pl platform for question answers please feel free to ask us any questions and leave that in the comment box we will try to answer as many questions as possible okay uh, i am karthik from novice learning academy so let's start the presentation so um, we are going through one of our worst times um, the current generation has seen okay um, so despite of what we are experiencing if you look at equity markets it's probably going in a direct, different direction altogether so many people are really puzzled you know how is this possible markets are doing so well but in general the overall economic health of the country or the, the general condition is not that great so to understand this what i would want to uh, probably throw some light on is what are some of the key influencers for the market okay there is always this one statement right when you are looking at investing in stock market or stock market direction in general it is not looking at today it is always looking at the future okay so the what is the future outlook is what market has looked at and then um, placed its uh, investment bets accordingly so what are those influences which is influencing the markets okay first and foremost uh, the government fiscal policy the the budget which has just gone by recently uh what are some of the measures which is really supporting the markets what is the monetary policy support that is what is central bank is supporting what is global factors you know global liquidity outlook and then how much india gdp growth would be this year okay after factoring in uh, pandemic uh, wave number 2 and then what is the equity market outlook these are some of the key elements what i would be looking at now first one when the government is deciding to act on supporting the economy essentially what they do is either they cut the tax rates okay which they did last year by cutting the tax rates for uh, the mid size and smaller size corporates okay or direct benefit transfers to the individuals so that they can go out and spend money i mean look at most of the developed countries especially usa they are giving direct benefits to their uh, uh, you know citizens in turn they would go out and spend that will drive the demand up which will eventually help the companies that's the second measure and third and the most important measure spending in the public infrastructure okay so these are the three broad measures which government would take through fiscal policy measures we call it as expansionary fiscal policy that means basically it supports the economy in turn markets would anticipate acha because of these factors uh, economy will do well we'll be in the path of recovery so equity markets would start recovering much earlier to this okay so with respect to infrastructure spending what the government is expected to do this year is uh, generally considered to be uh, great because close to 5 and a half lakh crores uh, worth budget they have earmarked towards capital expenditure so you must be thinking how will this help you know how will government spending on infrastructure how will it help you know there is a very interesting saying that if you spend 1 rupee on the infrastructure almost 2 and a half rupees comes back to economy which means there are jobs which gets created let's say there is one big infrastructure project given to a big infrastructure company they in turn allot sub contracts they would hire different uh, contractors the in turn contractors would hire say maybe equipment trucks and then they would hire laborers and they would you know so it's a chain link which gets activated because of which the employment generation picks up and then uh, that would start supporting or contributing to the economic growth so it is not just in the general infrastructure if you see the budgets allocated to metro projects or national health mission even that spending has gone up considerably so all these things would actually factor in for economic support okay 
and then the most important element in fiscal deficit in the recent budget what we saw was that government said we will not really worry too much about fiscal deficit as a number uh, we would go about spending more money that's why if you see fiscal deficit number of nine and a half expected now um, it was not just for this year government also gave a broad indication that in the next two to three years also we will we wouldn't mind keeping the fiscal deficit numbers high say uh, three three point two three and a half that was the range what we had pre covid now post covid uh, government is okay or accepted the new levels of six percent plus or close to seven percent so which means government will continue to spend not just this year but in the coming two to three years as well with respect to uh, the other all the developments what i just mentioned so this will definitely support the economy in turn the market should really start going uh, start doing well that's that's one general understanding what experts would give, tell you the second pillar is monetary policy measures that is apart from government what is rbi doing rbi has cut the interest rates to the lowest possible levels what we have seen since, since 2008 and 9 be it repo reverse repo all these you know let's not get into these jargons in a very simple terms rbi when they are dealing with banks their for their dealings interest rates have been reduced so what happens when for banks when their interest rates go down they will in turn pass on these benefits to the investors okay so the, what you see in the chart is repo rate uh, it is at 4% levels and this 4% is expected to continue in the times to come. I mean, in the next couple of months, this expected rate would, would remain low. So, so how will this low rate would help? Uh, that's what you must be thinking as an investor. Achha, how, will, how will I get the benefit? One of the disadvantages which many people are probably today not very happy with is with RBI lowering the rates to banks, banks in turn have lowered the rates of fixed deposits as well um, very few people would have seen these kind of fd rates like yearly 5% 5.1 5.2 which is probably one of the lowest what we have seen in the decade or so but at the same time the moment deposit rates goes down uh, the loan rates also would go down imagine today if you were to buy a house a housing loan uh, rates is much lesser than 8% you know there are some entities which are giving teaser rates at six, six and a half, six point eight, seven percent and so on. Or vehicle rates, vehicle loan rates at seven, seven and a half percent. So people at least who, whose job is fairly stable or whose business is very stable, they would really definitely think of buying house or buying other capital goods because interest rates are low. Not just that, even businesses also would think of the expansion because of lower interest rates. So this in turn would again help the economic recovery much faster, okay? Uh, so this, this is the graph when you look at the overall low interest rates should really push the overall consumption. Okay. Today, even if you want to take up a mobile phone or any other white goods on based on EMI, even there, the interest rates charged on such loans would be much lesser compared to what you paid pre-COVID levels. So this will drive consumption. So federal government measures, central government measures. And then what are some of the global factors? Because today, India is not an island, uh, right? I mean, we are not an alienated country. We are connected with all other global markets. Today, the foreign investors really look at, consider India as a, one of the most important, prominent investment destinations. So from that point of view, it's also important for us to understand what is happening globally. You know? USA will continue to expand their uh, monetary policy by doing quantitative easing. Again, let's not get into jargons. In simple terms, they are saying that we will continue to print more and more money and support the economy. But in turn, when they are the money, when that amount of money gets infused or increased in their economy, they will in turn invest that money into uh, markets across the globe. And India is one of the uh, emerging market, which most of the global investors would like to be part of. Other than that, this year, so whatever slide you saw is respective last year, from four trillion dollar to almost seven, seven and a half kind of a, a, a trillion dollar, three and a half, three trillion dollar stimulus which got added in the last one year. Other than that, the new government of USA they are saying that we are planning to spend close to two trillion dollars on mega infrastructure push, and they will continue to support small businesses, and they are intending to put more and more cash in the hands of the investors. Because of this extra push, 
US GDP is expected to be close to 7% for this year, 2021. You must be thinking, are sitting in India, 7% might not be too exciting. But for a developed country like USA, 7% is a phenomenal growth. They have not seen this kind of growth since 1984. Okay, so then even all other uh, leading economies also is actually following the suit. The uh, other than this, even their economies, they are keeping the interest rates very low. So that means in those countries as well, developed markets, people will be able to borrow more and more money and then invest elsewhere. So foreign inflows also would, would continue to um, uh, grow. Um, so this is the third pillar. Fourth, what is India's GDP growth expected? You know, where do we stand? You know, okay, fine, leave 2020. 2021 was a bad year, fine. But 21, 22, 22, 23, where do we stand with respect to growth? This is the expected GDP growth for two years. The left-hand side chart tells you for 2021, 22. The right-hand side tells you for 22, 23. What is the expected GDP? Uh, this is the uh, World Bank data. Uh, 12 and a half. This is, this is the data which was published in the month of April. Uh, experts are suggesting that there would be a revision downwards by one and a half to three percent. So it could be say 11 percent or say nine and a half percent kind of a uh, GDP growth, what you can expect for this year. Even at nine and a half, ten percent, we will be one of the, we are, will be the fastest growing economy in the world, not just for this year, next year as well. So if this is the case, then I'm sure um, the investors domestically as well as globally will continue to invest in equity markets, okay, Indian equities. So if you see Indian GDP growth, we saw decent recovery last year and this year also expected to do well because of primarily one reason, rural economy. Last year, rural economy was the backbone for our recovery. So what is it this year? This year is also same story. Rural economy should, should do perform well. Why? Because of one simple reason that the recent predictions on the monsoon rainfall is good. Uh, IMD's projection says we should our rainfall is normal, almost 98% should be the, uh, you know, like rainfall what we should receive this year. And a private agency, SkyMet, has predicted 103%. So that means someone is saying 98, someone is saying 103. And the factors which affects monsoon, that is not there this year. So with great degree of certainty, uh, monsoon is expected. Plus, the chart what you see is the water level, storage level in different reservoirs across India. Uh, what you see on the purple line is the designated capacity, that means actual capacity, and the red line is the current capacity. So this is before rainfall. Before rainfall, our current capacity or current storage is higher than last 10 years average storage levels. Okay, Definitely in South India, uh, last 10 years average and last year's average, we have beaten both. So that means there is sufficient availability of water resources for supporting the rural economy. Okay, so yes, uh, broader growth should happen this year as well. So what is the market view? The, the important element here is who would, which category of companies would get affected or would get that positive push? One very important factor here is if you see the profits generated by the large size company, okay, the chart what you see is large size companies, what has been the profit? The quarter on quarter profits for large size companies or big size companies has gone up considerably, right? I mean, from COVID level, if you see, you know, the first quarter and to December quarter, the profits have gone up. This is for large size companies. Uh, but whereas who has been impacted? If you see the... Uh, you know, like let's say difference between the you know impact for large size and small size companies. If you put all the companies in the stock exchange in, in 10 uh, buckets, which category of the companies which have been affected? If you see the, the category of the, the, the smaller size companies have been impacted the most. So what is that you can take away from this? Whenever a pandemic like this were to happen or a bad economic scenario were to happen, Everybody gets affected, but may not be equally. Big companies, because of, say, their ability to get bigger contracts or bigger orders, plus their war chest in terms of cash and so on, they will be able to face other situation like this better. Be it first wave of COVID, what we saw, or the second wave of COVID, what we are seeing. You know, if you see big companies, their overall market capitalization has gone up, right? 
so then who will get affected the smaller companies because they, their ability to big win bigger contracts or their liquidity levels or the working capital requirement that gets impacted so uh, so smaller size companies will will be impacted relatively higher compared to large cap so which means you could be uh, probably a little more aggressive on large cap and then opportunities in mid cap but stay cautious on uh, small cap this is my uh, personal view uh, so on that note without taking much time i would like to invite sunil sir to take it forward from here thank you karthik uh, and uh, so i think karthik has done more than half of my job because uh, he's given a very detailed perspective on both the economy and the markets right so what i'm going to try and do is build on karthik's presentation and so i'm not going to be as detailed as karthik uh, did it but what i'm going to try to do is to look at it from a futuristic perspective because one of the things that karthik did very well was to delineate all the actions and the steps right around what the budget was and what the monsoon and the market forecast but let's bear in mind that ultimately the pandemic has got its own life it is not in our control so when you then look at a market situation post pandemic one has to plan a portfolio both based on saying that the pandemic may continue for some time or it may come under control so accordingly in terms of a markets post pandemic it's very important to look at the underlying fundamentals that drive a market and to that fundamental is ultimately the economic story of the future right so without much ado if i will ask karthik to just to go so i want to focus on the pandemic with regard to the economy and if you see here right why is the fact that the second wave was perceived so badly is because of the fact that if you see the top 5 states in terms of nominal gdp are 47% of india's gdp and the very states which got affected in the second wave maharashtra uttar pradesh karnataka gujarat and then later tamil nadu are the ones so that is where the fear that the second wave is going to cause a damage to indian gdp growth and however you see that april and may got affected and as uh, karthik mentioned 250 to 300 basis points is the correction from the original projection for the gdp for india for this year right compared to what the second wave has done right and that's what i have got an estimate of 100 to 200 this varies to varies to varies but the key thing is the last line is that in all of these five states the active infection curve is turning negative so one of the reasons why the sensex has again touched 50000 today right one of the reasons why the market is doing this is the market is a forward looking creature it ignores the present they say used to say buy on the rumor sell on the fact in fact for the market is buy on the expectations sell on the reality that happens so the reality may be that the second wave is affecting but the market is looking forward so if i can go to the next slide karthik right the vaccination is the brahmastra right which is going to help us to look at a third wave possibility and how can we control so there are two graphs on this page the left hand side graph tells you the current story of the vaccination so the light blue shaded portion at the bottom tells you the number of people who have fully vaccinated that is got both the doses right you can assume to that extent they are covid free they are not going to be part of the population is going to get affected and do and then you see the larger darker blue is the one dose population right so if you see that's the number of million people on the left about 160 million people have got this but like i said the market we have just vaccinated 10% of our population for one dose they say that to get a herd immunity and to have the economy not so affected by the overall thing we need to vaccinate at least 70% of the population so i have given three scenarios if you turn your attention to the right hand side graph right the green first line tells you that we are going to double no please go back yeah we are going to double our rate of vaccination 
the light blue line says that we will go at the current rate and the dark red line says oh what if vaccine production comes to a bottleneck and comes to a halt not likely but as a market participant it is important that you have a realistic scenario a best case scenario and a worst case so in a best case by just this december we should have 70% and the government has stopped exports of vaccines is now importing the sputnik uh, vaccine they're giving approvals for some of the uh, johnson and johnson and moderna vaccines so we can reasonably expect that this calendar year the 70% target for the population at least one dose vaccination will be achieved and so the impact of a third wave can be said can be contained so this is one of the reasons that the market is viewing it positively the whole situation despite the bad news which the media is promoting in terms of the oxygen the ventilators the deaths and all of those things right so next slide if you can go forward right tells you that this story of recovery right is not just an india story of recovery right if you see i think karthik mentioned this in terms of a colorful graph i am showing it more as a table and if i draw your attention to the second last column and the last column that is 2021 estimates and 2022 and as karthik mentioned india is going to be the fastest growing country both in this year calendar year and the next calendar year right so one of the reasons that fii is continue to put money into india is because india has got the capacity to bounce back much much better now why is this capacity much much better i will cover but if you can just look at the bottom and read those four lines right first in the developed markets the pandemic has eased see the world situation is as important as indian situation from an economy perspective i'll tell you why shortly next emerging market growth will be propped up by the rise in growth of developed markets it's a very important line i want to specify here why you see developed markets are essentially demand driven markets see they have less of people they have higher per capita incomes so their demand exceeds their supply so all advanced countries when their growth goes well they import from where from the supply rich countries so either it's commodity rich countries like brazil and russia or labor rich countries like china and india they supply so the world growth is as important for india as india's growth it's only if the world grows faster and that's the good news that the pandemic is easing in the developed world so one of the things that the market participants that we look at is the key is not just to be domestic focus in our outlook and thought process but keep an eye on international economy because the long term sustainable growth of indian economy is very dependent on a world which is growing well if the world doesn't grow it's very hard for india to grow stand alone please remember that so that's why the last line we say that for the most part emerging market recovery will continue to be synchronous to the developed market recovery right so that's an important point So move to the next slide. So then the U.S. is obviously the biggest advanced country, which has an impact on everybody else. And what we are saying here is just to reiterate the point I made. So the yellow and the blue. There are two lines there. What is the yellow? What is the blue? The blue is U.S. goods imports. Like I said, the U.S. is a demand based, where demand exceeds supply. So when their GDP grows. the demand grows their imports grow so can you see the blue line when it's shooting up the v shape what is going along with that the yellow line is axj don't get confused by the terminology it's asia x for excluding j for japan because japan is a separate country which is almost like a developed country we take out that from the equation so then you can see as close as a husband and wife moving together right us imports goes up Asia's exports goes up. So I hope the point that I was elaborating is well made with this graph. So all of us should pray for a U.S. and other advanced countries to come back to the growth path as fast as possible. So please note this second point. Now, where is the within Asia? Right. Yeah. Next slide, Karthik. Right. So within Asia, the two big. giants are india and china in terms of labor supply right and what have you seen in the headline china plus 
So what is the story? The story is that over the last 10, 15 years, China has taken advantage of its labor supply to use the might of an authoritarian government to focus on infrastructure and becoming the manufacturing capital of the world. Almost every product, where from Apple, iPhones, to televisions, to everything, has parts made in China. But what is happening to China is that it's one family, one child policy has led from 2017 to a decline in its working age population. India, not having implemented any sort of family planning, is on a rising working age population. Today, the average age of the country is 28 years. But for the next 30 years, till 2050, our working age population is going to be rising. So what is happening? And the fact that the coronavirus started in China triggered this thought process in the world's leading big multinational corporations who used to source from China that, hey, we need to have a China plus one strategy because first, COVID hit them. Second, over-dependence on China is not good. Third, China's per capita income in the last 10 years has gone from $2,000 to $10,000. Five times. Where is India? At $2,000 today, where China was 10 years ago. Why is this important? Because per capita income means per capita wages. To put a small nut and a bolt together, an Indian laborer is five times cheaper than a Chinese laborer. So for foreign companies today, while China was very good 10 years ago, today it's five times as expensive compared to India to manufacture a product there. So everybody is looking at a China plus one. And what is the evidence that this is happening? The government has done a lot of support. What have they done? They reduced our tax rate from 35% to 17% for a new manufacturing company, number one. Number two, the infrastructure work that the Modi government has done means ease of doing business. We have improved 79 ranks. Right? Plus a lot of licensing, a lot of FDI liberalization. So the proof of the pudding is in the eating. What is the meaning of that? It is that unless FDI comes in, because India does not have the capital, the money to manufacture and export to other countries. So foreign manufacturers must come to India and set up factories here. So that money which comes in to set up factories, the permanent capital coming to India is called FDI. It is as opposite to FPI, which is Foreign Portfolio Investment, or FII, Foreign Institutional Investment. That is money which directly comes to the stock market or to the debt capital market. That can come today, go tomorrow. But FDI is permanent capital. Once you have set up a factory, you can't repatriate that money out of the country. So the proof of the pudding is the FDI flow. So the left-hand side graph shows to you the gross FDI flows. Can you see how it's been continuously rising? In fact, on the right-hand side graph, you look at it compared to three years ago, fourth quarter 2018, right? versus second quarter 2018. So three years ago, two and a half years ago, the country which has seen the maximum growth in foreign direct investment is India with 22% growth. Right, So you clearly can see it is not just foreign portfolio investors who are coming into the stock market and boosting our Sensex and our large cap indices, but People are putting permanent capital into India because they believe that India with its labor supply, the big two words, demographic dividend, which you would have heard a lot of people speak, is finally expected to come to play. The pandemic is a short-term blip. In the long run, once the vaccinations are done, once the third wave is controlled, the reality of India's labor supply, low-cost labor supply with a welcoming government will translate into GDP growth of a very fundamentally long-term nature. Can I go to the next slide now? Right. So that's what we say is that India's cyclical recovery. Why we say cyclical recovery? What is cyclical, non-cyclical? Consumption, right? FMCG, that's non-cyclical because come rain or shine, 
you have to buy toothpaste you have to buy hair oil you got to do everything but cyclical is capacity creation when you have a shortage of capacity is when you have to build capacity that comes in cycles it's a cyclical thing which leads to capital rupture which has a multiplier effect on the economy so what this slide is telling you is that just before the second wave india was well on the path of recovery but the second wave has delayed this only when the quarter one is impacted by the second wave the third wave we expect to be controlled by the vaccination drive so public capex exports to developed countries and domestic consumption are going to be the three fundamental driver i will say consumption is not cyclical no but when you have capacity creation then you have employment generation those employees who get incomes will then boost consumption so it's closely linked and inflation is likely to remain contained why karthik mentioned about a good monsoon forecast so food inflation is a big part of indian inflation basket and that is going to be easy means inflation will be contained so rbi which controls the policy rate we expect them to continue to support growth with a accommodative policy i think the data below are just what i explained i hope you have had a chance to look at it we can move to the next slide now this capital formation as i said is the key it's a key tracker for us to look at a portfolio from a market's perspective from a 3 to 5 years so on the left hand side we have broken up where does capex come from so you see there are four colors there right there's a dark blackish blue there's a gray there's a red and then there's a small black so the small black is the government the red is the public expenditure the gray is the household expense you must be household where is the capex when you buy a house you are supporting the capex of the country right because house needs cement steel wood paint tiles a whole bunch of things right so now when you look at it over a long term 2012 to 20 what are you seeing so instead of just looking at those colors and figuring out just go down to what is written below more than 3/4 of capital formation comes from private companies and households in near equal share so the bottom two graphs right the dark blue and the gray if you see 37 plus 38 75% so while government is there to kick start government is only a catalyst government is at best only 13% of the total capital structure what government does is when government does something it gives a boost to private capex because the cement company has to make cement so it in turn expands capacity then private capex gets counted so the government's effect is more of a multiplier rather than government itself being the big big spender so please remember that these government spends are of great importance and act as enablers now on the right hand side graph i talk to you about capacity utilization when will fresh capacity creation happen within a domestic scenario foreign scenario fdi coming to export is not a part of this right because that's the shortfall in capacity in china and for the developed world that is exports but for domestic capex for a company supplying capacity utilization has to go up as long as there is excess capacity why would anybody go and put in a fresh plant and machinery so the red dotted line tells you that because of the covid pandemic capacity utilization dropped because demand dropped so the existing capacity in the country was more than adequate for anybody to produce and spend but now as you see the v shaped recovery capacity utilization has started rising and what do you see in that dark black bar capacity creation dropped when capacity utilization dropped but as capacity is rising can you see that the drop has become less and in the last quarter right there is going to be a positive capacity creation bear in mind that from a stock market perspective this is one of the most critical things because let me take one capex to justify 37% comes from households right housing why i say this is one house built creates demand for 10 industries what is that take first which is the one cement next second steel third sand right and other building materials fourth electrical wiring copper aluminium fifth paints sixth tiling industry seventh wood industry eighth housing finance companies 
right and finally the construction and the realty sector so there are at least 10 that i have just named from the top of my head there are a number of others which will benefit so the multiplier effect of this capex is what going to lead to a number of sectors doing well and a number of stocks doing well right so as we now move to the next slide right from this capex scenario the other thing is that the state share of capex as a percentage of total expenditure, states can spend on revenue, can spend on capex. Revenue is something like a giveaway. It's here today, gone tomorrow. But when the state spends on capex, a multiplier effect. So if you can see, the state budgets for this year are showing a increased share of capex at 16%. And if you see in terms of growth rate, in the next graph, next slide, 37% is the growth rate of the state capex so yoy so the states are there to create the impetus for capital expenditure by focusing governmental spending on the right areas which has a greater multiplier effect the next slide please right so overall the other thing to remember about india is if you look at our growth, we all get worried by near term ups and downs in gdps and growth but if it's a longer term and put it in a channel you can see despite various shocks that our economy has seen right from the 1990s, right? Taper tantrums, commodity price drops, export shock, GST shock, NBSE default, COVID. But still our five-year average and the 10-year average are moving in a band. Despite external shocks, India is on a long-term steady growth path. That confidence I would like to convey to all of you. The next graph. Now. I come to my final slide to tell you that there are a lot of risks, a lot of things that are dominating people's mindset. So in this graph, earlier I used to show this graph as what are the risks. Now I've done, I have sized the size of the bubble to the size of the problem from a market perspective. So what is the biggest concern for the market? The commodity price rise. Right? That's why I put it such high. Metals and other oil, others rising, means that India is a commodity importing country. Because when commodity price rise, Indian companies' input costs rise and their profits get reduced, especially in a scenario where demand is affected in a pandemic. So immediate future markets concern, the biggest concern is of commodities. Is this price rise going to continue and hence come and affect corporate profits? So that's something to keep a watch for. Next biggest one is the Fed. Why? The US, I mentioned that we should all pray for good US growth. But there is a negative from a market's perspective in the short term. What is that? Because the Fed has been pumping liquidity. Fed has been keeping interest rates soft. However, if the U.S. comes back to growth faster, well, that's good news for Indian exports and Indian economy. For the markets, it could mean a reversal of liquidity. Because if the U.S. hikes rates, this is what is called, or they reduce the liquidity, it's called tapering. The taper tantrum we saw in 2013, which led to a shock in the markets, could lead to. So the second risk factor from this slide is the fact that the Fed is keeping track. And yesterday, recently, the Fed's policy meetings, which came public, said that over the next few quarters, not in an urgency or in a hurry, the Fed is going to look at how to taper the liquidity as U.S. growth numbers come back stronger, right? Then the reopening of the developed markets. Because that's the case. So when their growth comes and the reopening comes, then a lot of export oriented. So that is the other thing the market is clearly tracking. On the left, there is oil, which is a big uh, concern. If it rises above 70, 80 dollars, the US, of course, within the developed countries is the thing. And with Biden coming, global trade is expected to get a boost because unlike Trump, he's more for open borders, right? And then the other factors like COVID waves. Now, the world believes that COVID waves will come and go, but governments and companies and markets are better prepared to tackle these. And finally, the key thing is to look at the emerging market reopening in terms of a bounce back post the pandemic, right? With that in mind, Keeping on this slide only, I'd like to summarize our view of the market is that we believe that bad news on economic growth means liquidity will be strong and will support the markets. Good news on economic growth will mean that liquidity could get drawn, but economic numbers will come better and support the markets.
So the key thing is whatever happens, you've got to stay invested in the markets. How do you then prepare for which of these two scenarios happens? The best way to prepare for those scenarios is two ways. One, stagger your inflows into the equity segment over the next six to nine months as these risks play out, little by little acquire equities or mutual funds, right? That's the step number one, to protect yourself from any one of these factors going out because the long-term trend is going to be strong. The second thing is that a liquidity wave with the pandemic still hovering on the horizon will mean that large caps and safety-oriented sectors will be favored. But if the economy is reopening and there is some tapering, money will flow out of large caps, but the economic good news will be more broad-based for many mid and small cap companies. So the key in your exposure then is to maintain a balanced approach through a flexi-cap strategy. So keep large caps, mid caps, and small caps. Like Karthik mentioned, today, because the economic recovery in the post-pandemic is still not yet in the immediate future, keep small caps less. So from an allocation perspective, I would suggest that you adopt something like a 50, 35, 15. 50% in large caps, 35% in mid caps, 15% in small caps over the next six months in a staggered way. Then at the end of the year, if you see the vaccination story is good, if the US economic story is good, you can reallocate the portfolio. With that, I'd like to conclude my thoughts. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions at the end of this webinar. Thank you, thank you so much. Hello everyone. I will very quickly walk you through uh, what Grow does, what Grow will be doing in the future and walking you through the product. And after that, we're obviously very eager to take your questions. So we'll get started with that. Let me very quickly share my screen here. It's raining really heavily in my city. All right. So yeah, as uh, you would already know, if you're using Grow, uh, signing up on Grow is super, super easy. So is the, uh, it, it's all possible via your smartphone or laptop. 100% paperless. This is the explore screen that we call um, that, that we call the explore screen. Uh, when you open and log in for the first time, this is the screen you're taken on. And here there are three tabs. There's stocks, there's mutual fund, and there's gold. And uh, in each of these tabs, you have a sort of introduction to that um, investment uh, option. Like for example, in mutual funds, you have popular funds. Under that, you have collections, so on and so forth. Uh, you have the stocks tab under which you have stocks related uh, explore stuff, which means in this case, it's market indices, top gainers, top losers, and so on as you scroll down. And in the gold tab, you have the investment, uh, the option to start investing in Augmont Digital Gold, which is the only digital gold offering we have as of now, but um, we will be adding more in the future. This is what the mutual fund page looks like. So whenever you tap, the name of a mutual fund, no matter where it is, you'll end up on a page like this. This page is meant to give you all the possible information that you might need uh, as an investor. So it has everything from its launch date, its fund manager name, its holdings, um, other mutual funds in the same category, so on and so forth. Likewise, you have the stocks detail page where you have everything related to that particular stock that you might want to know, like P ratio, revenue, um, 52 week high, uh, it's, it's other ratios like you have P2B ratio and uh, you have EPS, all of those details uh, are visible on this page. And likewise, you have the gold page where you have all possible details related to Augmont Digital Gold Offering, which we have on our platform. Uh, it, it's sort of a misconception that many investors have in India, which means they think that mutual fund investing is all about monthly investments via SIP. This is not true. You can do one-time investments also, just something that you should know. This is the dashboard. Uh, again, it's divided into three parts. It has stocks, mutual funds, and gold. And dashboard holds your investments. So whatever investments you have, it'll be visible on your dashboard. So in this case, you can see your mutual fund holdings will be visible here. And in this case, uh, you can see there are a bunch of names. You can scroll down further and you'll see all your list. When you tap on any, each of any, uh, any 
of these names, you'll get an option that looks like this. So you can invest more, you can take out your money from it, or you can tap on um, more details and see other more uh, in-depth details of that mutual fund, like your transactions in that mutual fund, the folio number, so on and so forth. Of course, uh, redeem or withdraw won't work if it's, uh, if it's a tax saving ELSS fund and you're still within the lock-in period. After lock-in period, of course, it will work. Import and switch. So this is one of the most popular features we have on Grow. Um, import allows you to move your mutual fund that you might have started somewhere else onto Grow. So let's say you used another platform or someone else to start your mutual fund investment. You can move that to Grow. Go to your dashboard in the mutual fund tab and right at the bottom, you'll see this option called import. Tap that and just follow instructions and within minutes, you'll be able to track your investments. Likewise, you have switch. So once you have imported, then you can switch. So many times, many investments when they, they are made outside grow, they tend to happen on regular uh, plan mutual funds wherein you are paying a small commission. So if you want to stop paying that commission, you can change to direct. So first you have to import using the import option and then you can switch them to direct. Grow Digest daily and weekly. So every day, Monday to Friday and every week on Sundays, we send an emailer, which uh, is, these emails are designed to help every new and old investor get more, um, stay more informed about what's happening in the world of finance and how to go about investing. So if you have signed up on Grow, you should be getting these emails. If not, please check the promotions tab in your email. Um, and you can also get this, dig uh, this digest on this link, grow.in slash digest. If you have any other doubts, questions, queries for us, please do reach out to us at support at grow.in and we'll uh, try and resolve um, your query as soon as possible. Apart from this, you can also access the help and support section, which is available on the app and website using which you can raise a ticket and have a call, a chat, or even an email in case the help and support section does not help you already. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. YouTube, I uh, would like to highlight that now we have many regional ch channels also. So we have Grow Malayalam, Grow Canada, Grow Tamil, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, you will find all poss many possible languages covered and we, we try and keep the content on these YouTube channels very, very relevant for new investors. So if you are a new investor, please do check out our YouTube channel. You, you will uh, find it very useful. With that, I come to the end of my presentation. Uh, we will now take questions from our audience. Uh, so thanks, sir. Um, thank you, sir, for a very uh, enlightening presentation. It was very simple. I think that's been your strength. Um, so, Shikhar, since we are in the momentum, any which ways, um, uh, can you answer this question for us? Uh, when can we start investing into in FNO using Grow Platform? So, uh, as of right now, we have uh, started rolling out FNO. Um, some people have access to it, and uh, majority many don't and uh, i mean we're trying to make it as soon as possible i'm sure you'll understand with the whole pandemic situation things are very uh, i think i answered this in, in another previous aiki also that uh, with a with a with with a platform with so many options when you add a new feature or a product many things can uh, malfunction with each other and that requires a lot of testing so in times like this, when a lot of people have fallen sick and, you know, uh, generally people are a bit, um, you know, everybody's caught up at home. Uh, we, we are being very cautious. We don't want to um, change things a lot as of right now, but we are moving at the fastest possible speed as, as of right now. And we'll try and get this out as soon as possible. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so next uh, couple of questions are... Uh... For Sunil, sir, it would be really nice if you can really answer them for us, sir. Um, in your presentation, you gave that outlook already with respect to what allocation we should have between large, mid, and small. Uh, just to reiterate, you mentioned about 50% into large, about 35% into mid. 
and about 15 into um, small cap. But um, what's your take, sir? Uh, will mid cap as a segment, would, would it outperform large cap and uh, small caps uh, once the recovery path sets in? So my answer to that is yes. And uh, then you'll ask me, why did I put 50% for large caps and not 50% for mid caps? Okay, because uh, investing, so the question was only about outperformance. He didn't talk to us about risk or volatility. Yeah. The mid-cap segment will outperform, but it comes with increased volatility. As, as an investor, right, we all want returns, but are we prepared for the volatility? Our mental makeup undergoes a dramatic change when there's volatility. So keeping the overall mental health that you want to achieve a goal Right? That's where I gave that allocation. Now, if you're a person who can live through that volatility, which means you should be of a moderate to high risk taking capacity, then definitely mid caps is the space to be in because it is not as volatile as small caps. And it is also something which has some degree of interest from FIIs in the larger mid caps. So overall mid caps are the sweet spot. But they are not without volatility. So if you are prepared for a volatile journey, so, uh, then mid always, caps is the... Yeah. Yes. Sorry. I mean, um, Sundaram Select Mid Cap, I think is, a, is one of the legendary funds, um, what you have. I remember seeing it or tracking it since 2004. That's probably the first fund I got to know. <laughs> right? Um, uh, so then in that case, um, the another question is, not just with respect to post-pandemic, I mean, which of the best or ideal kind of mutual fund categories one should really look at as an investor? So again, uh, I when I give an answer, I always keep both the risk and reward factor in mind, right? So for me, FlexiCap is the best category because a FlexiCap fund can at times have very high proportion of mid caps or a very high proportion of large caps. They will always keep small caps at a certain manageable portion. It will never be 70% small caps, right? So I think FlexiCap is the best category because the fund manager's expertise on the outlook comes to help you out in terms of when should large caps be more than mid caps and when should mid caps be. When you have a clear view path to economic growth, with limited risks, mid caps will deliver the best return. So I would suggest that a mutual fund category, you should look at flexi cap as your point of entry into a mutual fund, you know, wherever you want to take equity risk. Um, so I'm, I'm sure, would it be the similar suggestion for someone who is a 23 year old and would start investing in mutual funds? Should they also start with flexi cap or you think because they're 23, it's okay to start with mid cap? See, the problem is that at 23, you have conservative investors and 23, you have aggressive investors. Not all 23-year-olds. See, we tend to think that 23-year-olds, the life abhi aage bahut bacha hai, to main risk lunga. Nahi. We all know there are 23-year-olds who are very, very safe. So it's, it's not the age, it's the risk mentality. Will you cross the road at a traffic signal only? Or will you cross it outside of a traffic signal? That will give you your risk-taking capacity. Because a, a person who looks at it and says, road bike khali hai, to make your signal that I want to cross, I want to reach this side, so I'll run across. So there's a risk-taking capacity in the individual. So each person should look at themselves purely from when you cross the road, and you can then judge. So for a 23-year-old who goes to traffic signals and wait, flexi cap is the best. But for a 23-year-old who will dash across the road, wherever he wants to cross, then I would say the best bet is mid caps. Because they straddle both. They give you long-term returns, but the volatility is also there in the journey. Yeah, I'm sure crossing the signal analogy fits perfectly well because it has got nothing to do with age. I mean, we have seen <laughs> someone in 40, 50 years also doing that. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Exactly. But, uh, but keeping long-term financial goals in mind, suppose if I'm a 23-year-old and then say that um, planning to set aside money for uh, 15 years or 20 years, that I'm very clear. Then in that case, I think, combination of flexi cap and mid cap fund should be a good uh... absolutely see if you are very very clear and you have taken the advice of a financial planner and you are taking uh, the expertise along with you then for me mid caps are the best space to be in okay right but like i said please be very clear that you when you say a 15 year goal you will actually put that investment paper in your locker and not look at it over the next 15 years <laughs> 
take that reassurance to yourself first if you are going to look at it tomorrow and say hey my 40 15 year goal now in 14 years and 364 days it is now becoming wobbly so it's all about the mental makeup because the equity markets are going to definitely be the best markets to invest in from an inflation beating perspective so the choice is your in your mind so i would say that's that's the way to look at it so um again the next question you already given a broad outlook um with respect to economic uh, growth recovery trajectory post lockdown mm. i think you've given us the scenarios if if we were to get uh, vaccinated right. in the current pace and doubling or half of it correct uh, but just to reiterate uh, what do you see post lockdown with respect to economic recovery we think will it be seamless uh, trajectory or we will see some kind of hiccups because of so, capital getting blocked and uh, so i think one thing to remember is that economic growth is always expressed in a comparison with the previous year yeah. so data is always y o y yeah okay so that's why you know people will say are yaar you put up double digit growth for india in this year but next year you are going back to single digit growth that's because last year's base effect because of a bad year in the pandemic is making this double digit we are not a genuine double digit growth this year is because it was a bad year base you're getting double digit so next year when we talk about again because this year is going to be a bumper year in terms of gdp growth next year even if you have a good year it will not look that great okay. so right so that's why next year 7 7.5 but i believe that it is the third year afterwards where i expect india will be in genuine double digit growth oh. because i see this pandemic behind us and all those other china plus one fdi all those other factors are a world which is recovering so india will be the manufacturing destination where we will be suppliers to the world i believe that we are set for a long 5 6 years of double digit growth from two years after today because okay. these two years are extraordinary years for these reasons after that yes i think we are set for a double digit growth sustainable growth and i think that is the way you should look at a indian economic story post pandemic sure. so uh, next one is a very interesting and a tricky question you know mm-hmm. so what's your outlook on commodity market i mean if you see the overall uh, composition of large cap the commodity as such is less than 5% but commodity stocks have performed really well uh, so what's your outlook and then this outperformance how much will it translate into an actual funds uh, performance so i think that the key to remember is that commodities uh, are base products of the world they are not manufactured products you dig out iron ore that you do some processing to make it steel you dig out oil you have gold you dig out gold you dig out copper you do minor refinements so commodities are essentially the base for the industrial revolution correct right so when does commodity rise so in terms of a commodity company normally in a stock market situation because the question is relating to a stock market situation around commodities in a stock market situation a commodity stock right does not rise because its earnings is going up but it rises because its earnings is expected to to go up yeah, yeah. so that expectation drives it so what happens is that when an industrial revolution is on the anvil commodity will go up first because people know that when industry picks up commodity demand will pick up so commodity price rises first then commodity earnings rises okay. so the reason i point out is the recent rise in commodity prices is driven by the fact that china was bouncing back first from the covid crisis okay. right now what is the story in china for the immediate short term i don't expect commodity rally to sustain for the reason that in china this growth was fueled by credit because even china there was a demand shortfall so bankers were given permission by the chinese government to lend recklessly and they l- borrowed and they bought into infrastructure story and commodity demand went up today china is getting worried about that credit fueled growth yeah. so they are now calming down the banks <clears throat> so the chinese led commodity cycle i think is close to an end but that the market commodities are not yet correcting 
which they should because of what karthik you mentioned in your presentation in terms of the us's 2 trillion dollar infrastructure spend mm -hmm. now that is still to pass the parliament approval in america yeah. right it is still a story but if that gets quickly passed by the senate house and the congress, congress. In, uh, then the commodity will receive a fresh burst because people will expect us to buy steel like there is no tomorrow to build all those roads and bridges and airports and everything so it's very important to track the industrial revolution to figure out the commodity revolution with the exception of gold because gold doesn't feed gold is not an industrial feeding product all other commodities are very closely linked to the industrial cycle so tactically commodities are not something you fill it shut it forget it you have to time your entry and time your exit and because even mutual fund managers find it hard to do it this commodity thing does not come into the equity markets in a big way you will only look at the metal prices and say it's doing well but nobody will go 100% onto one particular set so that's where it's very very difficult it's a very tricky play so generally i would say please stay out of commodities as a retail investor because a knowing when to exit is more important knowing than knowing when to enter when to enter and most retail investors make the mistake of looking at the past growth of commodities and entering entering yes so that's the risk in commodities so no, fantastic it's a it's a nice perspective so thank you so much so um you you're pretty bullish on equity markets right hmm. every expert tells us that when equity markets are going up gold prices go down yes right that that's that negative correlation so now considering that trend should i invest in gold today the gold has uh, three factors to drive it right okay. so first is that uh, economic bad news so gold is seen as a safe harbor okay. right yeah. second is hyperinflation gold is seen as a hedge against inflation mm -hmm. third is gold has a strong correlation with the us dollar negatively when the us dollar weakens gold goes up right so the reason gold went up was because when the corona pandemic came upon us the note printing quantitative easing or whatever you call it in the us meant that there was so much printing that dollar became weak right. gold right? and there was a worry on economic growth so gold went up what is the story now the story now is that the us is on the verge of economic recovery right so when economic recovery is news because gold is an unproductive asset unproductive. it is it is only a fallback option that everything else goes bad then gold will do well right so if you are a extreme pessimist then you should buy gold in big numbers otherwise i would say that because there are unpredictable events like corona coming up in the world you should always stay invested in gold to the extent of 5 to 10% but for taking it more than that you must be a pessimist otherwise keeping 5 to 10% one has always got to have a plan b right like one keeps some money in a savings bank account regardless of the fact that the interest rate is so low we still keep it that so that gold has a similar position in an investor's life that it should always be there as a as an insurance policy against bad news yeah yeah so that's my view on gold so if you see good news around the corner get out of gold in terms of the increased allocation over the 10% sure yeah i think from an asset allocation point of view uh, it still makes sense i think uh, mm. uh, so um it's it's great to be a uh, uh, passive fund manager now because the kind of acceptance levels what has come in in the in the recent past has been phenomenal especially when you look at Uh, index funds in etfs and also the variety of etfs what we see um, is is been great now for a for a beginner or a first time investor should they just start with an index fund you think that that story uh, sounds better i think that uh, see because the news was bad on the economy right it made sense to put in an index fund because there was no clear fundamental economic logic to market rise the market rose because of liquidity so no fund manager could predict the liquidity fund manager are good at predicting economy and when they saw bad news predictions right yeah, so yeah. they 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 so in such a situation is where an index which gets benefit of liquidity does better than a expert fund manager yeah. so the past 12 months 15 months has shown that index funds are a good way to actually make money okay but in a time when economic news gets better the economic predict 
production capacity of fund managers and analysts and experts will dominate this so if you see uh, in bad times index funds outdo but in a good time a fund manager always outperform so from a first time investors perspective right what you gain by investing in a range of mutual funds actively managed is the knowledge of what each fund manager is doing to make you a better investor Okay. so when you come into the market you are trying to become a better investor so that 5 years from now you will take far more intelligent and better decision than you do today as a first time investor so i would say that if you put your money only in index funds because bad news is there on the horizon you might turn out to have better returns but your knowledge gain will be zero because the index is passive so what i would say is even for a first time investor you always have a asset mix of some index funds and some actively managed funds so that you learn from a fund managers actions whether they are wrong results or right results your knowledge will improve okay right so pick two three mutual funds so you take large cap put in the nifty etf but put some things in a three large cap fund managers see what they are doing then you yes. learn so the as an investor you have to become like graham said an intelligent investor you will get that only by learning from mistakes not necessarily your mistakes but even another person's mistakes so don't go purely into index funds and then take the blame on yourself if tomorrow a fund manager outperforms right take a balanced approach so that your journey becomes better so in that case can we say um, uh, in the universe of funds maybe uh, flexi cap mid cap uh, maybe some exposure to small cap could be part of active funds but um, one could look at whatever large cap portion is there that could be in the index funds so i would say that i said 50 35 15 right uh -huh. so i would actually say the 35 and 15 purely should be in active management okay. because the liquidity in mid cap etfs and all is very very tight right, right? it is very hard for a mid cap index fund to even manage the tracking error because the rate at which the portfolios keep changing of the index itself he has to keep churning the portfolio over its portfolio. Stuff, right whereas in the large cap component right like you correctly mention of that 50% he can do 50 50 put 25% in index funds and put 25% in actively managed funds choose three or four funds 5 yeah. 6% each yeah right sir so uh, one eternal question you know is there a bubble you know uh, according to you Uh, not just in india globally is there a bubble no i think there's no doubt that there is a bubble but the question should be correctly framed as is that bubble going to burst <laughs> <laughs> you know why because you can enter in a bubble and exit when there is a bigger bubble. bubble so it doesn't mean so the point is yes there is a bubble why because economic news was so bad for the last 15 months yeah. that markets were rising because of liquidity so there is a bubble please have no doubt about it there's a bubble you have enjoyed the benefits of the bubble the key is is that bubble going to burst that bubble will burst in a very 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 how do i put it ironical way that if the economic news becomes good the bubble will burst if the economic news continues to be bad the bubble will grow bigger and bigger because central governments and central banks know only one way to tackle a crisis and that is to print my way out of trouble yeah. so if the third wave becomes a very strong third wave expect rbi to pump more liquidity expect government to announce more swaps and in the us the same way you expect that if the economic recovery is getting delayed then the fed will pump more money so bubble or burst is depends on whether you want to make money in the long term or in the short term because in the long term ultimately covid cannot last forever right scientists are at work sooner or later there will be a good cure today we don't have a good cure we have a good vaccine but you still don't have a proper good cure yeah. so i think that you if you take a view that in the next 12 to 18 months right the bubble can grow bigger if all this bad news continues but if you take a 3 to 5 year perspective this bubble will definitely burst because in 3 to 5 years i think the corona epidemic will be behind us and all economies will be on a recovery mode recovery so i think that's the right way i would say is that in 3 to 5 years this bubble is going to burst and when the bubble bursts right i think the safety oriented pure large cap is the one is going to suffer very very anti intuitive 
right? People tend to believe in large caps and the growth oriented mid caps, small caps are the ones going to do better. Mm -hmm. The point is nobody knows when is that crossover time. That's why I said flexi cap because you have to keep your eggs in many baskets. <laughs> and, and, and leave the job of stock selection to an expert and then just leave it there. Yeah, Absolutely. So um, I think one phenomenal phase I'm sure even you would be uh, amazed to see is last one year the number of uh, retail investors uh, be, who's coming into market, right? Almost 11 million or 20% of the DMAT accounts today was opened in just last one year. Correct. Um, now, has that made markets more volatile with more and more domestic investors coming in? In Keeping that in mind, suppose if they were to say, make mistakes, will they go back and then correction expected because of that, you think any possibility? No, no I don't think. I think they have played a very important role of providing liquidity to the markets. Okay. See, a lot of mutual funds, for example, small cap funds, right? Okay. In an economic downturn, you would expect a small cap to underperform. But today, last one year return, small cap has given the best return <laughs> of the three. Why? Because these retail investors have provided liquidity so that a small cap fund manager was able to churn his portfolio. When he went to sell, there was a buyer, a retail investor sitting there willing to buy. So I think that the retail investors are also part of a learning curve. I think they will come in droves. They will exit in droves. But I think they are actually a good part of the market. They are playing the role that many years ago, Badla, was ah, playing. Okay. Correct? So okay. you need that for everyone, why wants to sell, there has to be a buyer. So I think that while many people call them Robin Hood investors and said they are all, you know, uh, IRM, Gayaram kind of a thing, I think that that set of people will always be there. And these are the same people who are investing in Bitcoins, right? Yeah. So I think that that's the inherent gambling nature of human beings, which will always be at play. Right, And they are a vital part. If they were not there, there will be no liquidity in the market. Yeah. So I think that they are good and they will learn. They will enter through these things. They will burn their fingers. Then they will come to mutual funds saying it's better to trust an expert after having burnt his fingers. So they are actually a good part of the catchment area for mutual industry to grow, according to me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean so-called market veterans like probably you or so, so much and me and all, Correct. we would not have invested the way these guys have invested in the in last one year. Right? We've been very cautious and you no, know. No, absolutely. And you have to draw a parallel from cricket as to how India won the Brisbane Test with half the number, the the first choice team injured or not there. Yeah. Right. Because these people played fearlessly, no? Correct. For a Siraj coming there, a Washington Sundar, he never dreamt he would play for India. So he played fearlessly, Rishabh Pant, everybody, right? They were not the first choice, but they came out, their talent came out. So I think that fearlessness which they carry is a very important attribute. Okay. And I think that they will make mistakes, but I'm saying that they are the ones who will learn. Okay. Right? So okay. I think that they are a very important component of the capital markets. And I would not tell them don't do it because I will. they will never learn from only textbooks. Okay. It's only when you put your actual money, burn your fingers, realize why you bought, what you did, when you should have sold. The knowledge level, these same investors three years from now, five years from now, will be much more knowledgeable and will be contributing to a healthy growth of our capital markets. So I would not discourage this whole thought process of people dabbling in stocks. The word dabbling is treated negatively. No. They are doing with their money for a certain amount. See, my worry is if such people are putting 80% of their liquid cash into this. Yeah. Right? If they are putting 20-25%, that's fine. That's that's the best way to learn. Yeah, you can't learn swimming and reading yes. books. You have to jump into the water. Huh? Absolutely. Perfect example, <laughs> Karthik. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Uh, now, with, I think for, for the statement what you made, equity uh, market as an animal always looks forward. So from at least equity market point of view, to great extent, we can say that wave two is over, right? Because we yes, see the... Uh, yes, correct. To great extent. So yeah. now then, what's the story for pharma sector? Do you see wave three? Will that really cushion it? Um, I, read, I remember reading some report which said, uh, markets anticipated this in February, March itself. That's why Feb and March, Pharma stock went up and now that's why, you know. So. <laughs> See, because uh, two things here. So before you come to the pharma sector, let me answer about why the market is a forward-looking creature. Okay. It's because different investors in the market. See, what is the mantra behind the market? Buy low, sell high. Correct? 
Hello, can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you. I think there's a yeah. issue with Kartik, sir. Kartik. Okay, okay. Market's basic mantra is buy low, sell high. But the point is, so every buyer has to have a time from when he's selling. There are a few people who come in and don't know when to sell. But most institutional investors, right, have a clear horizon as to when they need the money that they are putting into the market. So a pension fund needs the money 20 years hence for paying the pensions it has guaranteed. Right? Uh, so the different players in the market come and buy a stock with a particular horizon. And what is the second mantra of the market? Everybody tries to project the earnings for the future, for their time horizon, discounts it to the present. It's called the DCF technique. Discounted. But discounted cash flow technique is operated for different time periods by different market participants. So if a Nestle is quoting at 10,000 rupees in one year, I will say it will go to 10,500. But if I have a 10 year perspective, I'll say that it is worth buying it at 10,000 because it will become 20,000. So the different nature of market participants, this is what. So when I say that a foreign portfolio investor is coming and buying India with a 10 year perspective, for him, whether he buys it yesterday, today, tomorrow, doesn't matter. You're buying it plus or minus 10% when he's looking at 100% as the ultimate gain. So where I'm coming from, is that the reason, that's the reason market always predicts the future because there are always players who are looking beyond the current, okay? And when the tilt of balance favors those people is when the market ends up being a lead indicator for the economy. So what you said when they say word lead indicator is when market rise before GDP rises, right? That's why people track the stock market to know whether GDP is going to go up or not, right? So the pharma sector, for example, right? So what the market does is that there are people, international investors, who have seen how the second wave came up. Sitting in India, we were complacent with the success of the first wave. But there's a foreigner who saw that in his country, this is the way it came out and the second wave came up. So that guy came and bought pharma in India. Okay. Right? So the point is that there are always people with different time horizons who are buying with their perspective and that's how markets become a lead indicator. So then can you blindly rely and say pharma stocks are going up, so second wave is coming? No, it is the expectation of a second wave. Whether medical reality turns or not is the gamble they are taking, right? So from my perspective, for a third wave, right? If the vaccinations are going to take precedence and control the third wave, then pharma is not likely to benefit. It is only if the vaccination drive fails that overall a pharma will get a boost because there will be more and more pressure and for prices will increase and everything. So I think pharma is extremely dicey as a play given how, because you see, look at it this way, right? The second wave hit us hard because the government was unprepared for it. Okay. A third wave, the government is prepared for it, right? When you are prepared for the ultimate, your preparations are much better so I would not be a long-term better on the pharma industry. Tactical play to keep a portion there to see if the third wave is more uh, intense than it was expected. So then again, pharma will get a bump up. Is something that is a short-term tactical play. But as a long-term play, I would say bet on the success of preparedness rather than the failure of unpreparedness. So can we say then the number of vaccines delivered versus pharma sector performance are negatively correlated? It should be. Inverse pro correlation will be there, right? <laughs> um, so one last question, is, oh, Shikhar. Um, Shikhar, digital, is a, digital gold is, an, is a new animal. Not many people would know. You know? Uh, how, how different is it from investing in a physical gold? Or how better is it from investing in a physical gold? And also probably... As an investor, I would be worrying that, Acha, if I'm buying digital gold, is it just a virtual gold what I'm buying? Is there a actual backing of the commodity there? You know, If you can throw some light. You're on mute. Uh, right. So, uh, yes, digital gold, when you're buying digital gold, you are investing in actual real gold. It's not, I mean, if it were not real, then how would it be different from, let's say, any other asset that is, you know, cryptocurrency is not real. It's, it's virtual, right? So if you were investing in gold that was not real or back, then it would be very similar to any other cryptocurrency that we have. Okay. Um, and of course, the, the 
the you know cryptocurrency being an asset in itself that's an entirely different debate because even the best economists today are not able to decide what it is and you know there's it's a very uh, raging internet debate so i won't go into that but as far as gold is concerned when you invest in digital gold there is actual gold being purchased and kept in a bank vault um so like for example i had just mentioned in our case we are working with this uh, ogmon digital gold so in our case the gold is purchased and kept in ogmon's vault so ogmon will have a tie up with another company which is uh, which specializes in operations like this so every time you buy gold there is a real physical gold being backed up somewhere right you actually own that gold now um, there are certain other digital gold providers that let you physically hold your gold hold in the sense like you can go and collect it so you purchased it and you can take uh, delivery of that gold on grow this is not available but we are trying to make this possible so the fact that digital gold can be uh, you know you can take delivery of your physical gold means yes there is a real uh, real gold somewhere okay now coming to which is uh, what is the difference between the two the biggest difference is you don't have to handle your gold in case of digital gold yeah. right so uh, if if you buy uh, if you buy physical gold you will probably buy biscuits or gold coins and they will be kept with you or in your house or you'd probably keep it in a bank locker and let's say uh, if you have a bunch of you know two three uh, biscuits that's one thing but uh, you know hopefully uh, you are a very rich person or if you are not a very rich person then you will be a very rich person some day so there'll be a lot of gold to walk around with If you if, you know you can't spend three crores worth of gold and carry it in a bag and walk back home, so in those cases, if, from a security perspective, digital gold is very very convenient. It's very very easy. So uh, that that's the main difference. Whereas on the other hand, the advantage of having physical gold is mostly in terms of uh, you know jewelry and all of those things, and. Uh, <laughs> i it's it's a very far fetched thing but in a in a very apocalyptic scenario then you'd probably want the physical gold in your hand uh, yeah i mean i i've heard stories my, our grandparents invested in gold because they saw partition kind of scenarios yeah. where overnight you have to pack things and and then run in that case this gold wouldn't do you that much good yeah so i i guess i'm sure uh, you agree to this the advantage of digital gold would be i don't have to worry about purity you know yeah. where i'm buying from some shop where i could be fooled on the purity assuming that when you go and buy gold you're buying from a good source which is coming yeah, yeah. authorized hall and, and and there would always be that difference right buying price and selling price you will never be able to buy it at the fair market price or sell it at the fair market price yes. that difference would uh, always yeah. be there so again so it would again if you're buying jewelry that that entire uh, angle comes into play and if you're not buying even if you're buying gold coins and gold biscuits all of these come into when banks sell gold coins uh, there is a they keep a decent uh, spread uh, yeah. for buying and selling those uh, okay coins. so actually to be very frank i'm i'm relatively young and i i have only bought digital gold in my life so i'm not fully aware of the physical gold side of things sorry sure. about that. yeah no no that's okay thank you so much uh, shikhar uh, so thank you so much uh, sunil sir i think you answered every question with a great deal of enthusiasm and uh, as simple as ever i think uh, thank you very much for giving us yes. uh, this platform um, and thanks uh, shikhar i wish all of you um, a happy weekend ahead uh, please stay safe and uh, take care thank you thank you thank you